This video should be watched after you have finished reading chapter two of the novel, The Great Gatsby. These notes and commentaries are suitable for high school students of English. We have read chapter two, so these seven quick questions should not pose a problem to you at all. Jot down the answers in your notebooks. Question one, what is Dr. T.J. Eckelberg? Two, who do Tom and Nick meet in the Valley of the Ashes? Three, what is unique about Fitzgerald's description of Mr. and Mrs. McKee? Number four, what did George do at his wedding that upset Myrtle? Number five, according to Myrtle, why does she leave with Tom on the day that she meets him? Number six, what event ends the party? And number seven, where does Nick find himself at the end of the chapter? The setting moves to the Valley of Ashes, situated between the eggs and New York City. It's here that we find the lower or working class folk in stark contrast to the Buchanans, Nick and Jordan. It was called the Valley of Ashes as this was where all the detritus of the coal fireplaces of New York City was brought, literally mountains and mountains of ash, giving the area a grey, dusty and dirty appearance. It would have looked something like this in the 1920s with this being a visual representation of the way it is described by Fitzgerald in this novel. Tom says, it's a terrible place, isn't it? Exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg. Take note of this billboard, a poster for an optometrist, Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. This is how Fitzgerald describes the valley. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens where ashes take the forms of houses and chimneys and rising smoke. And finally, with the transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. How would you compare the description of this area to the descriptions of Tom and Daisy's house? Dr. Eckelberg is a billboard, an advertisement for an eye doctor. More eyes in the novel, more glasses, more perception. But this eye doctor doesn't exist anymore. He's moved on. His weather-beaten billboard, however, remains. T.J. Eckelberg is commonly seen as a symbol of God in the novel. Large eyes in the sky. Here, Tom scowls at the billboard when he's there to steal someone else's wife. Later in the novel, we'll read this quote. Standing behind him, Michaela saw with shock that he, that's George Wilson, was looking at the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, which had just emerged, pale and enormous, from the dissolving night. God sees everything, repeated Wilson. And that begs the thought, why does God oversee the poor area of town and not the eggs? One of the settings is the Wilson Garage. 
Nick's first response to this area and the rundown garage is that he thinks it's fake. He's never been to a place like this before. He's naive, young, innocent. And the garage is deliberately described here with words like these, unprosperous, bare, dust covered, wreck, crouched, dim, these are very similar words to those used to describe George Wilson, the husband of Tom's woman, Myrtle. How is George portrayed to us, the reader? And as a result, how do we feel about him? George Wilson is not just grey. He is the colour of the walls. He is dust. His wife, it is said, walks through her husband as if he were a ghost to shake hands with Tom, showing the reader that even she doesn't respect George. Later on, Tom will say, George is so dumb he doesn't know he's alive. And yes, that is a foreshadowing alert. How would you describe Tom's relationship with George? And how much do you judge Tom at this point? This is our first look at Myrtle Wilson. Look at the words used to describe her. Thickish, middle, stout, surplus, coarse. But Myrtle is sexy. She's not ugly. She's not a beauty like Daisy. She's described as carrying her surplus flesh sensuously as some women can. And there was an immediate perceptible vitality about her, as if the nerves of her body were continually smoldering. What does Tom see in Myrtle? Daisy is, after all, of a higher class and described as more beautiful. And did you notice the sibilance, the repetition of the S sounds? She carried her surplus flesh sensuously as some women. You'll see that that sibilance is repeated later when we describe Gatsby. We learn a lot about Myrtle from one paragraph. She will change her clothes twice. Notice that the dress doesn't really fit. She likes to spend Tom's money and buys gossip magazines and perfume. Now, fashion colored cars were all the rage in the 1920s. Lavender, what color is that? And what does purple usually symbolize? Is this what Fitzgerald intends? Fashion magazines often portrayed upper class women with dogs. And of course, Myrtle wants a dog for the apartment. But is that all that's happening in the scene? What else is going on? What does Fitzgerald want us to think about Myrtle and Tom's relationship? And what does the dog symbolize? Oh, does everything have to symbolize something? Well, in Fitzgerald's work, yes. Plus, it's fun. Aren't you having fun? Follow the patterns in the writing. When an author repeats a pattern, it means something, or at least it's a good place to look for meaning. Myrtle asks delicately, is it a boy or a girl? And Tom responds decisively, it's a bitch. Look at these two lines from this scene. What do you notice? Why might Fitzgerald use a word like delicately for Myrtle? Does the word fit what we know of her? And why does Tom use such a crude word? Even if that is a word that one might use to describe a female dog, is it entirely appropriate? Does Tom even know that the dog is female? Or is there something else going on? 
think the dog versus Myrtle Wilson. Is Fitzgerald possibly equating Myrtle with the dog? Indeterminate breed. He didn't say mutt. So why use the more formal wording in an informal scene? Think of the description of the brown coat of the dog and Myrtle's brown muslin dress. That it won't bother you. That both are bought by Tom. Both are female and then the word bitch has a significance. And that Myrtle's not what she claims to be and the dog is certainly not an Airedale what the man claims the dog to be. It's just a cheap knockoff. Do you think Fitzgerald is deliberately describing the dog slash Myrtle in this way? This is a picture of John D. Rockefeller. He was one of the wealthiest men in the world in the 1920s. The man with the puppies is also an entrepreneur of a different kind. A dog peddler is nothing like Rockefeller. The comparison is supposed to come across as absurd. Now, from the description, this is the type of dog that Myrtle got Tom to buy for her. Definitely more an Airedale than a German Shepherd. And did you make the connection with Daisy? Both Daisy and Myrtle have a baby to occupy them, a girl and a puppy. Both ask the question, is it a boy or a girl? And both kind of ignore their babies. Daisy and Tom have a child, but she doesn't show up again until chapter seven. And the same with the dog. The New York apartment is not described in very flattering terms. In almost the same way that Myrtle's dress is described, she's too big for her clothing, the furniture is too big for the apartment. Do you see the young woman or the old woman in this picture? The painting in the apartment is once again about perception. We're never sure what's real and what isn't. Here's a reading or analysis tip. If an author uses a word that you usually would not use in those circumstances, it means something. Here, the dog biscuit decomposed apathetically. What does apathetic usually mean? Who's apathetic and about what? And it's not about the dog biscuit. And what about the word decomposed? Nick tells us that he's only been drunk twice. Why give us this information? And do you think that's even true? Conveniently, being drunk will excuse his behavior at the end of the evening. I love the reference in this passage to the book Simon called Peter. Now, this book was a real book. It was a bestseller in 1921. And reportedly, both F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway thought the book was absolutely awful. This reference is some serious author shade. As readers, we are made to feel uncomfortable with the descriptions of what happens in the New York apartment. It's clear that the purpose of this apartment is to serve as a place for Tom and Myrtle to have sex, which they do shortly after arriving, leaving Nick to wait with the dog. Awkward. Look at the paragraph where we meet Mr. and Mrs. McKee. The couple is described by swapping gender descriptors. He's described as feminine, while she's described as handsome. And quotation marks are used around the words artistic game. 
Mrs. McKee brags about being photographed by her husband, but only after they were married. It's all rather odd, suggestive, don't you think? The purpose of the chapter is to demonstrate the debauchery of these people. It could be because they're lower class or because they feel that in New York they may take more liberties. But they are different to Daisy and Jordan. Compare this scene to the dinner party at Tom and Daisy's house. And if you're thinking Gatsby is too high class for this crowd, mm -mm, think again. Nick tells us how uncomfortable he is and how he wishes he could leave, but can't. Although he's interested in the scene, he uses diction that implies that he's trapped. He says he's entangled, as if with ropes tied to a chair. He also says that many people get caught up in watching tragedy and bad behaviour in the darkening streets. The last sentence tells us what Nick feels throughout the novel. He continues to consider himself more of a witness to than a participant in the immoral events of the East. He is simultaneously enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. And did you notice the faces in the windows? They are watching too. Myrtle changes into a new dress. Why does Fitzgerald use costume instead of dress? What does it imply about Myrtle? Myrtle's dress is also noisy. The fabric is rustling as she moves about the room. How has this costume transformed Myrtle? Is that what she wants? What does she want? The word hauteur refers to her sense of self-importance, her snobbery, her pride in her newfound, albeit temporary, wealth. Look at the second sentence highlighted in Lavender. Notice the movement that Fitzgerald gets out of the sentence. Just like Myrtle, the sentence structure expands and moves as she does. And if you get into the sentence, you'll see how he uses parallelism to add the noise and movement, and that he uses repetition and comparison in the sentence structure. In a book about the sinful lives of the wealthy, the only time religion comes up, and in this case Catholicism, is as a part of a lie to make an excuse for the bad behaviour of two married individuals. F. Scott Fitzgerald was raised as a strict Catholic and considered himself a religious minority. But in this novel, no one is religious. In this exchange, Catherine explains to Nick why Tom and Myrtle don't just run off together. It's possibly an explanation for the reader. Nick knows why they don't run off together. And we may want to know why Daisy doesn't leave Tom for Gatsby. It certainly isn't because she's Catholic. In this conversation, Myrtle explains why she's so angry with George, angry enough, it seems, to cheat on him callously. And there is an irony alert here. Myrtle is pretending to be something she isn't, but she is angry with George for doing the same thing. And both use clothes to change who they are. However, George's borrowing a suit is hardly a sin. While she uses this as an excuse to cheat on her husband. It is ironic. When Myrtle tells the story of how she met Tom, she softens and moves closer to Nick. 
and the story is almost the same as the day that Nick, Tom and Myrtle went to New York. Maybe this tells us that their relationship is fairly new or that it hasn't changed since the first day. And notice the importance of clothing for Myrtle. She changes her clothes three times in one day and she uses her clothing to change her personality. She's angry that her husband didn't own a suit and her first impressions of Tom are based on the clothes that he's wearing. Let's get back to Tom in more detail. You should be adding to your character notes as we go along. Remember that Fitzgerald needs us to dislike Tom. So far, he's been established as an arrogant, racist brute, and now in this chapter we see that he's an abusive jerk. If we don't dislike Tom and feel sorry for Daisy, then we can't be on Team Gatsby. Tom breaks Myrtle's nose for disobeying him and for saying Daisy's name. The brutality of the moment is enhanced by the choice to pair it with something so minor. If Myrtle had thrown a drink in Tom's face, our reaction to this might have been different. Until now, Fitzgerald has not been complimentary about Myrtle. We don't have a lot of sympathy for her. But because her crime is so small and her punishment so fierce, we do feel sorry for poor Myrtle and her nose. Did you suspect that this violence was coming? What clues were there? Do you remember that Tom was described as having a cruel body? Do you remember Daisy's hurt finger? Do you remember how Tom snapped about the dog? This fits right into Fitzgerald's purpose with Tom's character. We should despise Tom so much at this point. And when Daisy and Gatsby reunite, we'll think that Gatsby can save Daisy from Tom. At the end of the chapter, the little dog returns. Now he's blinded by the smoke and groaning. The dog has been completely forgotten about by this time. Like Daisy's baby, the dog's there, but totally ignored. And did you note the reference to blindness, which ties in with the images of spectacles, such as those of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg? Now, hidden between the dog and Myrtle's nose is the sentence. People disappeared, reappeared, made plans to go somewhere, and then lost each other searched for each other, found each other a few feet away. It's easy to miss, but it describes not only the party, but everyday life. It also describes the relationship between Gatsby and Daisy. These are the last moments inside the apartment in New York. We won't be back. Fitzgerald ends the scene the way he begins it. He brings back the cramped space, the gossip magazines, the oversized furniture and tapestries. They stumbled here and there among the crowded furniture with articles of aid and the despairing figure on the couch bleeding fluently and trying to spread a copy of Town Tattle over the tapestry scenes of Versailles. This return reminds us that Myrtle's life is nothing like she thinks it is. Look at what a poet Fitzgerald is being here. Bloody towels upon the bathroom floor, a long broken wail of pain, awoke from his doze and started in a daze toward the door, scolding and consoling, the despairing figure on the couch bleeding fluently, there's alliteration, rhyme, interior rhyme. Think of the irony of using poetic methods to describe a scene of such abuse. What's the difference between the way the women respond to Myrtle's nose 
and the way that the men respond. Why do you think Fitzgerald does this? When we first meet Myrtle at the beginning of the chapter, she is the thickish figure of a woman blocking out the light from the door. The light, green and otherwise, of this novel is Daisy. Myrtle's thickish figure is blocking that light. She has tempted Tom away from his sweet and beautiful wife with snake-like ways. She's cheap and there's nothing about her that has any merit at all. If Daisy is a flute of champagne, well then Myrtle is a box of wine. Both Daisy and Myrtle are named after plants. One is a pretty flower, the other a woody bush. Generally, Myrtle wears brown or cream. Daisy always wears white. Daisy is pure and clean. Myrtle wishes she could be like Daisy, but dirty white is the best she can do. Given that there are only three female characters, we can look at them to give us an idea of how Fitzgerald sees women. It isn't good. One is a siren, Daisy. One is ornamental, that's Jordan. And one is a cheap knockoff, that's Myrtle. Women are reduced to items of sex and beauty. A drunk Nick leaves with an equally drunk Mr. McKee. And Nick looks at photographs in McKee's portfolio. And since Nick is telling us the story, Nick is giving these photographs names as he sees them. And each represents something that he has seen. Now sure, these could be lovely photographs taken by McKee and these could be their titles. But why would Fitzgerald add this detail? He edited the book over and over again to get it down to its most condensed, minimalist form. Why? And wait, Nick's telling us this story months after all this happened. He was super drunk and he remembers the names of random photographs. I don't think they're random at all. Do you see that the titles of the photographs could be a summary of the first two chapters of the book? Beauty and the Beast. Could that be Daisy and Tom? Loneliness is that Daisy trapped in her loveless marriage. Or Gatsby standing alone at the edge of the dock, arms outstretched towards the green light and Daisy. Old grocery horse. Could this be George Wilson? Sad, abused, a broken man treated like garbage. Brooklyn Bridge is the bridge that takes Tom and Myrtle into New York City. And is it too much of a stretch to think of the bridge of Myrtle's nose that Tom broke with his open hand? You remember the questions at the beginning of this lesson. Check your answers. Number one, Dr. T.J. Eckelberg is the huge billboard advertising an optometrist. It's a picture of a pair of eyes wearing spectacles. Tom and Nick meet the Wilsons, George and Myrtle. Fitzgerald inverts the gender adjectives for them, describing Mr. McKee as feminine and Mrs. McKee as handsome. 
George borrowed a suit for his wedding. Two reasons, his stylish clothing and the thought that she can't live forever. I suppose that's an earlier version of FOMO, fear of missing out. Tom's brutal assault on Myrtle, breaking her nose with one swipe of his hand. After leaving the McKee apartment, Nick falls asleep on a bench at Pennsylvania Railway Station. If you have any queries, please don't hesitate to contact me at the email address that you see on the screen. A shout out to Amy Goldman, a high school English teacher colleague in the United States, who has been so generous with her knowledge and enthusiasm for this novel. This collaboration across the world is how education and educators should work. Thank you, Amy.